a word? Yes. Amen. Amen. Okay. Oh, today's so good because, you know, I think every single person in here has got a problem that's been haunting them that they need an answer to. Is that right? Today, God said he's going to give it to you. In this session and the next session, expect for God to give you heavenly strategy, stuff that you may not have ever expected or even thought of. God's going to bring it to you so you understand how to go and take that strategy and solve your problem. Okay, so we loose that right now into the atmosphere in the name of Jesus. That God, you're delivering the mail today. Yeah, come on. Thank you. And we come into agreement with you, Father, and the plans of heaven to break every single person, every single person here out of that situation that they've been in for all this time, that today will be the day that they'll receive the heavenly download and strategy that you have for them, that heaven is thinking for them, so that they can break out of that situation and have success and victory. We agree with you, heaven and the Holy Spirit, now, in Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Thank you, Lord. So not long ago, God gave me some prophetic words. Why does God do that? Well, in Amos, it says that the Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. Why does God do that? Because what he's doing is he wants to make sure the body of Christ knows what heaven is thinking so that the body can begin to align themselves with the will of God and begin to get positioned to help God execute and release the government of Jesus onto the earth. So one of the words the Lord gave me for this year was the word possibilities. The word possibilities means the potential for favorable or interesting results. In this upcoming season, the Lord said the possibilities for us are going to be endless. Come on. Amen. Amen. There's going to be more supernatural visitation on earth than ever before. And with those visitations, the kingdom of heaven is going to be made manifest here in ever increasing manners. What does that mean for us? It means that things you've been praying about for a long time are going to happen a lot quicker. Sometimes instantly. Though the warfare is probably going to become greater and, and, and more intense, it's also going to become easier. Because you're going to get in a position where you are able to access the wisdom and revelation of heaven and be able to use that strategy to quickly snuff out the enemy. Quickly. To go in and make a decisive move back by kingdom strategy. Amen. You're not going to be contending for years for the same promise to come to pass. Year after year, trying. Where is it? What's going on? What's happening? I'm contending. I'm contending. It's not going to happen like that anymore. You're going to become so skilled. Your victories are going to become swifter. Sometimes they will be even effortless because of the things that you're going to even learn today. How is that going to happen? What's the vehicle that God is going to use to enable all those words to come to pass? When I asked God that, I, I wanted to hear heaven's answer. So I didn't try to reason it out myself. I got quiet and I waited for God to speak into my mind. And when I got quiet in the stillness of my mind, I heard Ephesians 2, 6. When I went to it, it says, We are seated in heavenly realms with Christ. You see, the Lord told me that this year, more of the body is going to begin to operate, learn how to ascend in heaven and operate from their legal position there. You see, there are people in the body that are doing this, but God wants to bring it into a widespread move where this is one of the things the body is continually operating in with ease and comfort and skill. So this year, the Lord says that that is going to happen, that more of the body on a mass are going to be able to be seated in their rightful position in heavenly realms and be operating from there. What does that have to do with the possibilities being endless? Well, think about it. Everything you need is in heaven. Amen. Right. right? The answer in every situation, the cure for every disease reconciliation for your family, wellness for your soul, man, healing for your mind, wisdom for your life, strategy for your business and your ministry. It's all in heaven. Amen. It's all in heaven. See, when we learn how to ascend into heaven, we can take hold of all the enablements that are there and then descend back down to earth, bringing them here, causing them to then become manifest. Does the Bible say that that is truth, that that can be done? 
But that's what the purpose for ascending is, to bring the things of heaven down to earth. I'm going to give you a string of biblical proofs of this right now. In Genesis 28, we'll start there, it says that Jacob experienced an open heaven. I want you to listen to the verse in verse 12 of that chapter. It says this, And Jacob dreamed there was a ladder set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. And there above it stood the Lord. Okay, notice the order in this scripture about this angelic visitation. I mean, the angels are first, the scripture says, ascending into heaven. Then they're descending back down to earth. I mean, you would think it would be the other way around, wouldn't you? Isn't that kind of odd that they're doing that? Why do you think that the angels are, are having their activity in that particular order? Because Hebrews 1 forces that angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to those of us that have received salvation. You have to understand, see, angels are already here on earth ministering to us. So see, in the story that the angels that Jacob saw were, were already at work down here because the first thing they did was ascend into heaven. So you know that they were already here at work. So when Jacob saw the ladder that day, the scripture says that the Lord was at the top of the ladder and he was speaking promises over Jacob. So what was happening? When the Lord would speak promises over Jacob, then those angels that Jacob saw would ascend first into heaven to get the things needed to make those promises come to pass. Then they would descend back down to earth to bring them down here. That's why we need to ascend. Because when we ascend into heaven, we can get the heavenly enablements that we need to cause the promises of God to come to pass. Then we can bring them back down here to earth. Now, Jesus, Jesus talked about angels ascending in that order. In John 1, Jesus is talking to Nathaniel, and this is what he says. He says, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you all, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. There's that strange order again. The angels first ascending into heaven and then descending back down to earth. Why? Well, again, the job of angels is to minister to us here on earth. See, when Jesus was here on earth, angels were attending him. Remember what it says in Mark 1 in the scripture where Jesus is doing the 40-day fast? It says at the end of the fast, angels came to attend him. Remember what it says in Luke 22 when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane getting prepared for the crucifixion? It says that an angel came and strengthened him. So see, according to Jesus in his discussion with Nathaniel, whenever he needed supernatural enablement while he was here on earth, the angels that attended him would first ascend into heaven to get the supernatural stuff he needed and then descend back down to earth to bring it to him. You see that? I always wondered about that, and the Lord turned on the light for me one day. I was like, why are the angels ascending, descending? Didn't they come from heaven first? That's what, yeah, isn't that interesting? See, in heaven are all of the spiritual aids we need to solve any problem here on earth. And the scripture says that angels can ascend into heaven and bring back those enablements back down. But what about we as human beings? Does the scripture say that we can go and ascend into heaven, grab hold of things and bring them down? Yes, it does. The Bible is replete with proof of men who have ascended into heaven. In Revelations 4, the apostle John, he ascended into heaven. John records the experience this way. He says, after this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard addressing me, like the calling of a war trumpet, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place in the future. And at once I came under the Holy Spirit's power, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. John was just a man, yet he was able to ascend into the throne room of heaven. In Exodus 24, the scripture says that when the Israelites were at the foot of Mount Oreb, that, quote, Moses and Aaron and the 70 elders of the Israelites went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like the pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. They saw God, they ate, and they drank. Moses, Aaron, and the elders of the Israelites went up. They went into the throne room, and they were just men. Notice the scripture says that they ate and they drank. What does that mean? That means that not just their spirit man went up, but their physical bodies actually went up too. 
Does the Bible substantiate that that is possible? Yes, the apostle Paul himself says it in 2 Corinthians 12. He says this in verse 1, True, there is nothing to be gained by it, but as I'm obliged to boast, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up in the third heaven. And I know that this man, whether in the body or away from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise. And he heard utterances beyond the power of man to put into words, which man is not permitted to utter. And Paul says twice there, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but God knows. He says it twice. Why? Whenever something is said twice in the Bible, you need to pay attention to it because it's very important. So here, according to the apostle Paul himself, human beings can ascend into the heavenly throne room, both in the body and out of the body, with just your spirit or your physical being going too. Notice each time someone went up into heaven in the Bible, it was so that they could either have an encounter with God or so that they could get something so that they could get some sort of enablement. When the elders and Moses went up, they got to encounter God. They actually got to eat and drink and stand in the presence of the Lord. When John went up, what happened? John got so much revelation when he went up, he got all of heaven's instructions for all of the seven churches. And he got the complete download for the whole book of Revelations. You see that? He didn't just go up for a visit. He got up and he got all that wisdom and strategy and enablement and he brought it back down here to earth. We're still feasting off of what he descended from heaven with. We're still feasting on it. When the man that Paul was talking about went up, he heard utterances that the Bible said were too powerful. Too powerful for words. It was revelation that was so top secret that that man could not repeat it. It was, it was stuff that men are not permitted to speak about. And trust me, there'll be some times that you go up and you'll have some stuff happen to you and you need to ask the Lord, Lord, is this something that I am supposed to release or is this one of those revelations that's just for me, between me and you? We see danger in the, in the church. People are going up and they're having heavenly experiences and I believe all of these things. I mean, I've, I've heard some crazy stuff and you know what, my spirit testifies that it's all true, but it doesn't mean that we are released to speak about it all. Do you understand? We don't want to go to charismania. Do you understand? We need to be stewards over what we're given when we go up. So all you have to do is ask the Lord, is this something that I can release and speak on? Or is this, this a revelation that man is not permitted to speak? Amen? We must be good stewards. We should not, here's the thing though, we, we should not look at ascending as some flighty, charismatic, crazy tool. Let's go ascending into heaven. That's not the purpose of it. Though the experience is wonderful, and the experience builds our faith, builds our hope, brings us closer to God. But the thing is this, is ascending is a tool. It's a kingdom tool that God has used and given us so that we can use to bring the things of heaven back down here to earth, so that we can be like John and get all the strategy and bring it back in into this earthly realm and then release it. Each one of us is like a superhero. Do you understand that? You're a supernatural being. Amen. And superheroes wear what? Super belts. They got those utility belts on them. It's the same with you and me. We're like superheroes with a supernatural belt. And through the years, we've been learning certain tools through the biblical text, through the word of God, and we've been taking these tools and being able to put them on our belt so that we could use them to bring the kingdom of heaven and make it manifest down here. I mean, remember back in the day when you, were to, you learned about the word of faith? That was a tool you put on your belt. Remember when you first learned how to fast? That's another tool you put on your belt. Remember when you, when you first learned how to do warfare? That was another tool on your tool belt. Same about when you learned how to, to, to cause the glory to be made manifest. That was yet another tool. See, step by step, over all these years, through all these conferences, through all the things that we've been learning, we've been taking our tool belt and getting more and more tools and mastering the ability to be able to use those tools in a higher, more skillful manner. Now the tool belt's getting fuller, which means what? That we can do bigger jobs. You can take on bigger problems when your tool belt's full. 
right? If you want to hang a tiny little picture in your house, what do you need? Maybe a hammer and a nail. But if you want to hang a big heavy mirror, what do you need? A drill bit, a level, a drill, the right size screw, the right size anchor, right? You need more tools to get the bigger job done. The more tools you have expertise in using, the more jobs you can get done, the more problems you can overcome. How many tools do you think it takes to build an entire house? Right? As you began to take and collect and to master the use of all these different tools, God's going to put different assignments in front of you, bigger assignments, because he'll know that you can take them on. And you can conquer that problem. You can solve it. You can bring the kingdom of heaven into that situation because you're skilled at the use of all these different tools on your tool belt. Ascending is just another tool. We're going to talk about it today, and I'm going to show you how to use it as such, especially in the second session. The second session, God's told me that you're going to be able to take the tool of ascending you're going to learn here in this first session and use it to be, immediately begin solving your problems. Yeah. Immediately, today. One of the specific things that the tool of ascending will enable you to take possession of. The first one is the glory. What is the glory? Revelation 15 says, And the sanctuary was filled with the smoke from the glory, the radiance of God, and from his power and from his might. You see, the glory is all God is. It's his presence. It's his radiance, his splendor, his character, his nature. And according to this scripture, the sanctuary in heaven is filled with the glory. It's just like the atmosphere, that air is the atmosphere of earth. The glory is the sanctuary. It's, it's filling the sanctuary is the atmosphere of heaven. When we learn how to ascend into heavens, we can have access to that glory. Why is that important? Well, for one, there's creative power in the glory. I know you've all heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. How did God create the entire universe? He did it through the vehicle and the presence of his glory. Genesis 1 says the empty void was there and God's spirit or his glory cloud was hovering over that void. And God waited for his spirit to be present before he started creating. And once his glory was there hovering, he spoke into the glory. He said, let there be light. And bang, there was light. You see, there's creative power in the glory. And since the glory is saturating the throne room of heaven, if you can learn how to ascend up into heaven, that means you have access to that creative power. You can begin decreeing things in your life that have not been happening, prayers that you've been working on for years and have no movement. But you can go up into heaven and begin to speak into the presence of the glory cloud and things will start to be created for you and manifest here on earth. You know, that's how God and, and the Son, the Father and Son, are both still creating in heaven the same way. Why do I say that? Because remember what Revelation 15 says, that the sanctuary is saturated with the glory cloud, right? Well, when John went up on his visitation in Revelation 1, when he went up to the sanctuary of heaven, listen to how he records his encounter. He says this, I was in the Spirit wrapped in his power in the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice like the calling of a war trumpet. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And from his mouth came forth a sharp two-edged sword. When John was up there, he saw a sword coming out of the Lord's mouth. What does that mean? What does Hebrews 4.12 say the sword represents? It's, quote, the word that God speaks. You see, he's up in heaven and a sword is coming out of his mouth. God's having words coming out of his mouth, creative words. They're going and they're being released in the creative power of the glory, the glory that's saturating the sanctuary in heaven. So every time you get a revelation or every time a healing manifests or things are happening here on earth, it's because God's up in the presence of the glory, speaking into the creative power of the cloud. You can ascend up in heaven and do the same thing. We need to start acting like father and son. Amen? Ascending into the glory can also be used as a major tool of transformation. What do I mean by that? The scripture says that we are transformed into his image from glory to glory. That means that every time you sit in the glory, in God's presence, you actually get changed. <clears throat> That's good news, especially for somebody like me. All right? Because I can be a mess. <laughs> Does anybody here need to be changed? Yeah. Anybody who didn't raise their hand, I rebuke that lying spirit off of you now. <laughs> I can be a mess. 
And I'm telling you what, if you ever tried, if you ever finally said, okay, God's totally revealed to me that I'm a mess in this certain area, oh my gosh. And then you tried your hardest to be changed. I'm not going to yell at my husband anymore. I swear to God, I'm not. And you just can't hold back. Your flesh overcomes you and you begin spewing this demonic vomit out on your husband or something. But you're trying to change. You're holding your breath. You're ready to sew your lips shut. Do anything you can not to have that happen anymore. I'm going to be changed, God. I swear it, I am. I'm so tired of doing that because you know it really doesn't work that good. <laughs> it's so hard to be changed on our own. We need to have the will and desire to come into agreement with the will of God to be changed. But we also need some supernatural help. And the Bible says that we are transformed into his image, his likeness from glory to glory. So what does that mean? If you have an attitude problem, man, and you need to have an attitude adjustment, you can ascend up into the glory, sit in the presence of God and be transformed. And let me tell you what, that is way easier than trying to do it on your own. Now, I want to give you an example of how powerful this is, that this really works. Okay, just this week, this week, I was under major attack, and God was also dealing with some things in my heart. I had some stuff going on that he had been asking me to do for quite a long time, and I'll get into this more in a bit, but I just want to make a little point here. This thing he was asking me to do will be such a huge sacrifice. If I do this, it will completely change my entire life. It will be the biggest sacrifice I've ever done for the kingdom. And I've done a lot of sacrificing for the kingdom. I have. And so I was really contending with God. It's like I didn't have the strength to say yes. In fact, I was kind of getting an attitude problem. Because, you know, I did prison time, so I don't take being bullied very well. And I actually felt like God was giving me the old, come on, what's up, in the shower right now, you and me. Okay? I was. And I was responding by like, bring it. Let's go. Wrong response. Look, I never got whooped in a fight, but I never threw down with God in the shower either. I'm sure I would get whooped on that one. So there I was, and I am like fiercely fighting this thing that God is telling me to do. And between that and the attacks that were being released against me and everything else, I was just, it was just overwhelming. And so I laid down. I said, Lord, I need to ascend into heaven, and I need your wisdom. I need your help. I need to be transformed in your presence. Help me. So I ascended into heaven, and what I saw was I was standing back in the hallway of a dark house. It was all dark inside. And I looked, and the front door was closed. It's never a good thing. Yeah. And the little tiny window at the top, I could see the glory and the brightness of God's presence on the outside of the house, trying to shine through that door. And I was up there, and I went, oh, God, help me. What do I do? And you know what he told me? It was so awesome. He just said, open the door. <laughs> All right, smarty. So by faith, I saw myself walk open, and I opened that door, and the light and the glory flooded into that house. What does light do? It brings revelation. Revelation will always bring you peace. Because when you know what's going on, you're no longer going, what the heck is going on? You just know, and it gives you peace. Oh, and, and what does the glory do? It transforms you. And I want to tell you what happened. That was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday. By 6 o'clock in the afternoon, I was so empowered by that encounter with glory that I was able to say yes to God, what he was asking me to do. Something I couldn't say yes to for years, I was able to say yes. And I took action on it. I didn't just say, okay, God, I'll do it later. I did it. And then by 9 o'clock that night, the Lord came and visited me again. And he said, Jacob's ladder is now in your house. And angels are ascending and descending, bringing you all the things you need to make that happen. 
and I had an angelic visitation fill my house. Jesus. I'll tell you what. It sure beats trying to change yourself or get into a fight in the shower with God. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. A standing can also be used as a tool to bring God's glory here to earth. Jesus told us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means that he wants us to bring everything that's in heaven back down to earth. How do you do that? Ascend and descend. Ascend and descend. Now remember what Jesus said in John 17, 22? He said this to the Father concerning his disciples. I have given them the glory which you have given me, that they may be as one even as we are one. You have to understand something. Jesus has already given us the glory. It's already ours. It legally belongs to us. So what we can do is we can ascend up into heaven and by faith we can take a hold of what has already been given to us by the Lord and then descend back down to earth, bring it down here and loose it into the atmosphere. That's what I do all the time. When I ascend into heaven, I grab hold of the glory. I ask the Lord to give me the glory that Jesus has already given me. I bring it down to earth. And then when I come down on my descent, I open my mouth and I say, I loose that glory now into this atmosphere in the name of Jesus. So I loose it into the atmosphere. And then I begin to pray into it. Because remember, that's how God created all the things in the universe, right? He spoke into the presence of the glory cloud. I utilize that glory to begin to do prayer work into it. And I begin to release decrees or things, petitions that are on my heart into the presence of that cloud. And you know what happens? Nine times out of ten, I'll feel a burning on my face and on my arms. To me, that signifies that the glory is present. When I feel burning inside of me, in my body, it's my gifting being activated. It's my anointing. But when I feel things in the external realm, the glory is external. It yokes itself with your anointing. That's inside. It sits outside helping your anointing, lifting up your anointing. So what does that mean? When I have that burning sensation, that means it worked. That means I, I, I really did. I really went up to heaven. I really got the glory. I really brought it back down. I really loosed it. See how God will use those little things to show you that what you moved into by faith is actually real and it's really happening. It's really taking place. Do you see that? Amen. Ascending can also be used as a tool to gain wisdom, access to the wisdom of heaven. This is what James 3 says. But if you have bitter jealousy, envy, and contention, rivalry, <laughs> selfish ambition in your hearts, do not pride yourselves on these things, and thus be defiant and false to the truth. This superficial wisdom is not such that comes from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, animal, even devilish. But the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure, undefiled. It's peace-loving, courteous, considerate, gentle, full of compassion and good fruits. According to James, the wisdom that originates down here in this realm is of the flesh. It's of the flesh. It is unspiritual and it's even devilish. Say you have a problem. We were talking about this earlier and I'm going to bring it up again later. And you're trying to figure out the answer to the problem. Oh my gosh, how do I figure out the answer to this problem? And all you're hearing in your mind is your own reasoning going back and forth. Remember what it says about reasoning? It says a double-minded man is like a, way, a boat in the sea, right? He never gets anything he's praying for because he's going back and forth, back and forth. You're reasoning out what you should do with the problem, and that is not giving you the right answer. You have no peace. You're getting confusion in your mind, and you're hearing all this demonic chatter because down here in this realm is demonic chatter. So what do you do? Go above the chatter, man. Ascend into heaven. We're the wisdom that's pure and unadulterated with. We're all the answers to every problem you need is up there. Don't listen to your reasoning of your flesh. Don't listen to the noise of the people and the circumstances around you. Don't listen to the demonic chatter. Go above it. Get into the heavenly realms and receive your answer. And I'll just give you an example of that. Patricia King is our apostolic headship, and you know, her job is to lead and guide myself and this ministry into being totally integritous 
and to walking out the total will of God and to watch over us and to make sure that we don't slip off the path or get into sin or anything else. And a couple months ago, we had a very big conversation on the phone. And it was this. She said, I want you to hold back on some of your teachings because you're a forerunner. You're breaking through into new stuff. And um, your stuff needs to be seasoned first because if it isn't and it's released before it's time, it will get contaminated. Now, this is hard news for a girl like me because I'm a forerunner. I'm breaking into new stuff all the time, man, right? And I, I'm very pleased that we have her to rope me in because <laughs> <laughs> I need that. But, you know, now we're having people reviewing my teachings, making sure they're biblically accurate. And so we bring the highest integrity stuff to you guys so that you know that the Bible lines up with everything that I'm preaching and everything else. And so I said, so I said to her, well, what do I do in the meantime? She goes, well, just teach the basics. Go and do something simple. And I'm like, <laughs> you mean do what everybody else is doing? Oh, no. I don't know how to be normal. I've never been normal. So that was like a blow to the gut for me. I'm like, oh, normal. Oh, no. <laughs> so I said, I was honest with her. I said, you know what? I don't even know how to do that. But I'll have to rely on the Holy Spirit to tell me. So we hung up the phone. And I go, okay, God. Tell me if she's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to say something. Well, even if she was wrong, which she wasn't, I would still obey her. Because when you obey your headship, you get blessed, even if they're wrong. Yeah. Right. And then God's in charge of changing their mind. Okay? So even if she was dead wrong, I'm still going to obey her. Okay. So, but I just wanted to check. <laughs> I was hoping she was wrong. No, I wasn't. Yes, I was. <laughs> so I went up. Remember she said, if you release it too early out of season, it'll get contaminated. So I went up, and I saw a vision. I saw a vision of a big plate of food in front of me. That's my food. That's the stuff I'm serving you guys, right? Big plate of food. And somebody else was at the table, and they were over here, and instead of me serving it to them, they reached over and grabbed it. And then as they were bringing it over to their plate, it was actually on their fork. It dropped off their fork. They reached down and picked it up with their fingers and handed it to someone else. That's contamination. See what happened? Heaven proved exactly that she was right. Rats. <laughs> But, you know, when that happens, you get this level of peace. It's no longer you contending against somebody. It's like, okay, that person was right, and now I really feel good about submitting because I know heaven's thinking the exact same thing. And I knew right then, too, that God would give me the ability to do the simple stuff. Please, God. No, really. Okay, so you see that? You can ascend into heaven to get the unadulterated truth. And wisdom from heaven. Okay, thirdly, when you learn how to operate in the heavenly realms, you're over all the powers and principalities in the dark realm. This means your warfare is on a whole new level of ease. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. He operates in this realm from his home base in the second heaven. When you learn how to ascend to the second and third heavens, you're up over him. He's under your feet for real. And you're going to have way more power over this. Let me give you an example. So I'm in Oklahoma City. No, I'm not in Oklahoma City. I'm in Ponca City, Oklahoma. And we're staying at um, the home of some farmers. They're wheat farmers. Okay. Now, the wheat farmers in this area had lost their harvest for six years straight. The entire region had lost their harvest over and over and over again. And... The Lord began to speak to me that this year, that these people were going to receive the special six-year blessings, which is in Leviticus 25. And I began to speak that over them, that God's saying you're going to receive a special six-year blessings. And then they came back and they said, well, you know, this year is a very important year for us because um, there are what's called extra grains in the mash of the wheat. So I guess that year, the stalk... Is, Instead of having like bunches of twos for the seeds, there was like three or four extra seeds in each bunch. So this was like a multiplied harvest that they were expecting to happen. And we happened to be there right around harvest time. And they were praying that this year would be the year that they wouldn't lose their harvest, especially since it was going to be such a huge harvest. 
So it's just about harvest time. We're at home at, at, the, at the people's house that are hosting us, and a huge storm comes. And it's like 60 mile an hour winds, and the rain is deluging. And you know, if wheat gets too wet, it will not stand back up, so you can't harvest it. Then we get a report from another farmer who calls and said that there was a hailstorm, and it was 16 miles away, and it was coming our direction. And you know what hail does? Farmer, wheat farmers hate hail because hail comes in, it beats the wheat off the stalk, and it causes the grain to fall on the ground where the farmers can't harvest it. So we're out in the back, and here's the storm coming, and Stephanie and I were out in the back with our hostess, Kevin, and we're out there, and we're doing what Jesus did, and we're rebuking the storm and telling it to be quiet and cease in the name of Jesus right now, and nothing was happening. How many of you know you can't fight stuff that's up here from down here anymore? It doesn't work. So I said, excuse me, <laughs> and I went into the bedroom, and I laid down, and I said, God, you got to show me what's going on up there, because obviously we don't know, so we have no dominion over it. So I laid down, I said, take me up now, and man, he, he went, boom, and he took me up so fast, I was like, Ugh! and I went up, and in the sky was a black dragon and a red dragon. They were causing the storm. They were causing the hail. And so I'm up there, and the first one was, it took me just a minute, but I got him down really fast. And it was, the, it was the red dragon. He went, and I stabbed him, and he went, and he went down, and he was laying on the ground, like, like that. I'm not kidding. Okay, and then I turned around, and there was a black dragon. I was like, in the name of Jesus, what? And he went down, too, just like that. And then it was over. And I came out of it, and I saw a vision of a perfectly golden, ripe field of wheat, perfectly dry, ready to harvest, with a big, gold, solid gold Liberty Bell in the center of it. So check this out. Six years those things have been up there. That's what the problem was. Do you know what red stands for? Red dragon. Red stands for to be in the red, to owe money, to be indebted. That's what that whole area had been. Those people had hawked their lives up to their gills just to try to make it so they could cultivate their fields every year to try to get a harvest to come through. Do you know what black means? It means an area as in an area blackened with drought. The assignment of the enemy of drought and indebtedness had been put over that region. And here's how demonic that assignment was. Every year, those people lost their harvest right before the harvest. They didn't lose the field or the crops like six months ahead of time. It's like, what does that mean? That all the time, that whole season, they're putting in their time, their energy, their money for fertilizer, their money for uh, weed killer, their money for the water. They're spending all their energy out there. And then right before the harvest, they lose it. It's like that assignment just sat up there and waited until the last minute and said, ha, ah, you're going to harvest and now I'm going to come and take it from you. And those people have been praying and praying and praying to try to break out of that spirit of poverty and break out of that indebtedness and that drought that had put on that area for six years and they've never been able to do it and 20 minutes of ascending and it was over. Yeah. 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 They harvested. Amen. And you know what? The hostess, Kevin, who, was, who had us stay at her home, she called me like a few days later. And she said, you're not going to believe it. I was looking up stuff on the Liberty Bell because you saw that Liberty Bell in your vision. I'm like, yeah. She goes, did you know there's a scripture on the Liberty Bell? And I'm like, no, I didn't. I had no idea. What is it? And she goes, it's Leviticus 25. Talks about the six-year special blessings in the year of Jubilee. <laughs> See how good God is? There are certain things that you have to get up there to fight. There are things, when you see things happening in the natural, it's because there's something happening in the supernatural. Like if there's an area of drought or something going on, that means that up there over that region in the supernatural, in the second heaven, something's going down. And you can be down here praying all you want. I'm not saying to stop praying because that piles the ground for things to happen and it cultivates the arrival of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. But you also need to learn this technique so that you can begin to ascend up into those regions and actually see eye to eye what the problem is. Oh, there's two dragons up here. No problemo. <laughs> is that like the Terminator? I'd be back. When you also learn how to ascend and operate from the third heaven instead of down here, you're going to experience a stream and continuous flow of the supernatural encounters. Why? Because you're in heaven. Hello? 
What's in heaven? God's on the throne, the emerald rainbow, the four living creatures, tens of thousands of angels, the trees of life with the leaves that have the healing for the nations, the river of life, all that supernatural stuff is in heaven and you'll be just like the angels when you ascend into heaven you grab a hold of all that supernatural stuff and you descend back down to earth and you release it into this realm so the supernatural will begin to manifest regularly It'll be regular business for you to have manifestations of supernatural encounters regular business and that's the way it should be Amen. that's the way it should be we have the uniting of heaven and earth coming let me tell you a story about this sword that i brought with me today See the oil on it? Yeah. Yes? I think there's more now than there was. Is there? Got more oil on it? Can you yeah, see? Well, I'll go by. Okay, so I am up in the heavens one day. First, I, I had this sword, right? Okay, so I'm doing some sword work, right? And I'm, I'm doing some sword work, and I'm taking dominion over certain things, blah, blah, blah. And then the Lord says, lay the sword down on the bed and ascend. So I did. And when I ascended, I went up into the second and the third heavens, and I went and got translated to Australia. So I'm over Australia, and God is telling me to decree the loosing of uh, the fathers and the sons because the, the chains have been on the, the families to separate families. And I found out later, I actually talked to an Australian who came and said, you know that they have massive child abuse there, and the fathers and sons have been separated, and they even took all the Aborigine children away from the Aborigines and said that they could raise them better than the Aborigines, and there's this huge division between families. And I'm like, no wonder God is telling me to do Malachi 4, 6 and go and break the chains off of the, of the divisions and the things that are holding father and sons back. And as I was sweeping over Australia, it was like I was sweeping over and wiping out like thousands of computers that had porn on it with, these, with the men that were watching and, and, and alcohol bottles were being cracked in half and, and joints and dope was being flung out of their hands and I was sweeping over thousands of children and all the chains were coming off of them, right? And so then I have this wonderful experience and then I come back out of it and the Lord has me go over and I reach over and I pick up the sword and it has oil all over it. Okay, okay. I've been touching the sword. I just was touching the sword. I just was fighting with the sword. I had put my hand over the handle. I had the sword in and out of the, of the sheath. Okay, there was no oil on it when I started that. How come there was oil on it when I came back? Because what? I ascended into heaven. I took a hold of the things that are in the supernatural and when I descended back down, I brought the supernatural with me. And the sword was anointed to say that, not to make the story any longer, but that we have a magistrate anointing now. We have a magistrate anointing over foreign soil. You can't go in and kick butt unless you've been given legal right to do it. I have the legal right now to go to other countries and kick butt. Okay? See, now that's going to become regular business. When you learn how to ascend, you're going to bring back this stuff from heaven with you. What do you think about that? Give God a hand for letting us do that. I know all of you want to experience that kind of stuff. And this kind of stuff is biblical and it's real. This is not, this is not us working up something that doesn't exist. The Bible is replete with proof that this is real and we can do it. Amen? Okay, so how do you do it? How do you ascend into the heavenly realm? So I'm going to take you through biblical steps today. But first I want to go over something that's very, very, very important. It's one of the most majorly important factors that you have to have if you are going to have encounters with God. And that is holiness and righteousness. Do you want to visit the throne room? Do you want to take possession of the things of heaven? Do you want to know the secrets and mysteries of the kingdom? Then one of the most vital, important things that you have and are walking in is righteousness. The Bible says that righteousness is always connected to experiencing the things of heaven. Let me prove it to you. In Matthew 5, it says this, Blessed and happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for being and doing right, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. According to this verse, it is the, it is the righteous who take possession of the things of heaven. And it's not the only scripture that says it. The Bible is replete with proof that tie holiness and righteousness together with you experiencing the supernatural. Listen to what it says in Mark 5. 
The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Have a change of mind, change of conduct for the better. Believe in the good news. According to that scripture, the kingdom of heaven will actually come near you. It will manifest. You will be able to come near the kingdom also. When you repent, when you are asking forgiveness of your sins, you see, repentance puts you in the position of being able to see and take possession of the things of the kingdom. Jesus said in order to experience heaven, we must be walking in total holiness and righteousness. I want you to listen to this extreme statement he says from Matthew 5. Jesus says this, For I tell you, unless your righteousness, your uprightness, and your right standing with God is more than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa! According to this, you'll never be able to ascend into and have access into the kingdom of heaven unless your uprightness and your right standing with God exceeds that of the Pharisees. They did it all by the book. How can we ever exceed that? The answer is through Christ. You see, He is our righteousness. One of that scriptures say that in order to gain entry to heaven, we need to be perfect in, quote, our uprightness and right standing with God. Well, it is Jesus who gives us that right standing. What does Romans 3 says? It says, but now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith. In Jesus Christ to all who believe, there is no difference, for all have fallen short and sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, it's because of Christ we're made righteous. And if we continue to walk in the righteousness that Christ won for us, then we'll have th access to the things of the supernatural. Okay, I want you to listen to proof in this Ephesians scripture. And as I read it, I want you to notice the order in which it talks about these scriptures. You're going to see that the order in the scripture shows that if we are washed in the blood of Christ, it positions us to be able to take hold of the things of heaven. Okay, listen. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our offenses, our shortcomings, and our trespasses. Then the next verse goes on to say this. When we are washed into his blood... He will, quote, make known to us the mystery, the secret of his plan. Then the next verse says this, and the plan is this, to unify things, things both in heaven and things on earth. You see, God's bringing it together, man. He's bringing the two together. We see that example in the ascending and descending process. Ascend up, get what heaven has, bring it back down. That's how you unite heaven and earth. And according to the scripture in Ephesians, when you are washed in the blood, then and only then will you be in position to receive the secrets of the mysteries that will enable you to unify the things of heaven and earth. It's always, always, always righteousness and holiness that gives us access to the supernatural. Always. Always. You know, we've been negligent in this area. Both sides are wrong. Let me tell you. I have people stand up and leave my meeting all the time because I'm being too supernatural. I want balance. Remember before you went supernatural, what happened? You were in a church where you heard righteousness and holiness stuffed down your throat every week and you got sick of it. So you thought, I need to go into something more powerful. I want to see manifestations of God's power. I want to see him heal. I want to see him deliver. I want to see the stuff that's in the book of Acts and in the Gospels. I want to see that. So we moved up and out of that church, and we went into what we thought was a higher realm. And you know what? This is a powerful realm. But we can't leave behind what we left behind. You know what? We need what they still are giving. And guess what? They need what we have too. There must be a meeting of the minds. A unifying of these doctrines. It's like one is too extreme and so is the other. We've gone too cuckoo crazy. And they don't have the power we have. We have to revisit where we left. We have to go back there and we have to take a hold of the foundational doctrines of Christ. His holiness, His righteousness. I'm telling you what, this is key. If there's a, a big key ring, the biggest key on it is this. Christ. The holiness and righteousness of Christ. And that gives you entry into the gates of heaven. 
Do you understand that if you don't have that key, there's going to be a fence, a barrier that goes and gets right up between you and the visitation of God. Let me show that to you. When we're living holy and partaking of Christ's sacrifice so we can be holy, then we can move into the supernatural encounters. We've got to stop wanting that supernatural so bad that we skip over that vital part. When we don't do that, God will deny us access into the heavens. Here's scriptural proof. Listen to what happened to the Israelites at the foot of Mount Oreb. In Exodus 19, God called to Moses from the mountain. And he told him to sanctify the people because God was going to come down in the form of the glory cloud on top of the mountain and visit his people. He was going to speak the commandments to the people. So as part of his instruction to get the people ready, this is what Moses, the Lord said to Moses. He said this, And you shall set bounds for the people round about, saying, Take heed that you do not go up onto the mountain or touch the border of it. For whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death so go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. See, the people, man, were so anxious for that supernatural encounter. They were so anxious to see the Lord that barriers had to be erected at the base of the mountain, and the people had to be warned not to cross over them. Why were those barriers erected? You see, at that point, the law, which it eventually would enable the people to be washed of their sins, had not been issued yet. So the sin was still all over the people. So if they crossed the barrier and went up on that mountain, their sin would cause them to perish in the presence of the holiness of God. Not only would they not get the encounter, but they would die. That barrier still exists today. We can't ascend up in the mountain and meet with God in the throne unless we're first washed clean of our sins. If you want to ascend into heaven, you must first remove the barriers of sin that are blocking your way. In Exodus 20, when Moses built the barriers and then he sanctified the people, God came down on the mountain in all his glory and he verbally spoke the commandments to the people from the mountaintop. And afterwards, this is what the scripture says, listen. It says, when the people saw the thunder and the lightning and they heard the trumpet and they saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear and they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Then the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Did you hear that? The people didn't want to hear the law from God. They couldn't receive it. But Moses responded to them by saying, Don't be afraid. God's come to test you so that the fear of God may be with you so that you will not sin. You see, Moses understood that it was the people's sin that was keeping them separate from God. And he knew that if their sin remained, that the separation would continue. What does the next verse say? It says, and the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. You see, the people, because their sin was all over them, were cut off from a supernatural encounter with God. But Moses, who understood the importance of holiness, he went right up, didn't he? He went right up and ascended into the presence where God was. Amen. Absolutely necessary element for you to be able to ascend into God's presence. If I were you, I would practice being washed every day. And you say, washed every day? Well, once I'm forgiven and I receive Christ as my Lord, why would I have to do that? Some people don't think that you need to ask for forgiveness every day of your sins. So I disagree. And why? I'll give you an example in the natural. Let's say I came to you and was a real punk and did something totally, totally nasty and mean to you. And then later on, I came up to you and said, well, you know, I don't really need to say I'm sorry because I was forgiven of all my sins when I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. Would that go over very well with you? Sins would be throwing downwards in, in, in prison. Okay. Do you understand that it is when we go to people and ask for forgiveness that our relationship with them is restored? It's the same thing with God. If you sin after your salvation experience, you're not going to lose your salvation. But there is a barrier that gets erected between you and God. And you need to remove that so that the relationship can be restored. Remember what Jesus told us. He told us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Meaning pray this prayer every day. Pray for forgiveness of your debts every day. Before I go up any time, before I go up, I practice being washed 
in the blood of Christ. Now, we talked about this earlier. You know, God has been really on me to do something specific. And it was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. I knew it was going to completely, dramatically alter my entire existence. And I was going to have to give up everything and sacrifice everything in order to do this thing. And my life would never be the same. And I fought God tooth and nail on this thing for quite a few years, actually. And he gave me grace in the beginning. He let me contend with him. But after a while, my contending became straight disobedience. Disobedience is sin. And I remember the day, it was just this last week, when, when my contending turned into sin and it crossed over that line. I woke up, and you know what the first thing I heard was? The heavens are shut. I don't know about you, but I can't live without an open heaven. I can't, I, I, I won't receive the wisdom I need. I can't minister. I can't help any of you. I won't be able to help myself, no matter what. I won't be able to help any of you. I have to have an open heaven. When I went before the Lord and I had a visitation and, and he helped me and he changed me in his glory and I came to repentance and I agreed to do what he was telling me to do, bam! That visitation came. The heavens were open and angels were ascending and descending in my home. What happened? I removed the fence, the barrier between me and God that was at the foot of the mountain. That barrier had gone up. So I'd advise you to be washed in the blood before you spend time with God each day. And if you are, are going to move into this practice of ascending into the heavens, that is absolutely necessary. You won't be able to cross over the barrier and get up that mountain if you don't. Amen? Okay, we're going to go through these quickly. Ready? I'm going to give you the steps to ascend. So the first thing you need is the holiness, right? We just talked about that. Second thing you need to do is to cultivate an open heaven in your home. If you don't know how to do that, you have to carve out a realm of open heaven in your home, then you should get our disc, the light and the glory, or there's another one back there. Um, I think it's called climbing the mountain. Now there's a thing that there's a difference between carving out a realm and keeping the realm open. Remember what the scripture says. Jesus said in John 1, he said, Most assuredly, I tell you all that you shall see heaven opened and the angels ascending and descending. It's way easier to ascend when the heavens are already open. Okay? So what do you do to do that? Holiness is the one, right? Because it says that blessed are those who are righteous, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> if you continue cultivating an attitude of righteousness in your home, it will cause the heavens to be opened over your home. Watch what's coming out of your TV. Watch what's coming out of your mouth. Both can change the atmosphere in your home. Okay, if you start getting in, you know, if you blow it, you blow up, or you start gossiping, turn it around, repent quickly, and then what? The kingdom of heaven will be at hand. Okay, the doors will remain open. Also, use your thanksgiving to keep the doors of heaven open. It Psalms 100 says, we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. In heaven, there are gates and doors that when you open, will enable you to send easily. What did John say in his his experience when he went up to heaven, he said, behold, a door opened to heaven. John so easily went up because the door was already open. Okay, Thanksgiving, we use Thanksgiving to open the gates. We open, we enter into his gates with Thanksgiving. So you can cultivate that in your home by simply watching how you respond to your daily circumstances. If there's something going down that's disagreeable to you, you need to make a conscious decision to turn your conversation around and begin to thank God and to praise Him anyway. Because your grumbling will not open the gate, and it will not keep the gate open. Okay? Your thanksgiving will, though. So if you make a conscious decision to say, look, I'm not going to grumble during this. I'm going to thank God instead for everything He's done for my family, for what He's doing in my heart, for everything He's done in this home. You'll see that your continuing sacrifice to make a conscious effort to thank God will keep the gates open so that you can ascend easily. Okay, next. What gives us the legal right to ascend? Once again, Ephesians 2.6 says we're seated in heavenly realms with Christ. Seated as past tense means that you're already there. You have the legal right to go there whenever you want. Next, what is the vehicle that enables you to, to ascend? In Revelations 4, John says this, that a voice spoke to him and said, come up here and I will show you what, what must take place. And at once, John came under the Holy Spirit's power. And behold, he saw the throne room. So you see, it was the work of the Spirit. It was the power of the Spirit living in John that enabled him to ascend into heaven. Okay? Number five. What else do you need in order to ascend? You must activate your faith. This, the Bible says that we ascend into heavens by faith. 
In Hebrews 11.5, the scripture says, Because of faith, Enoch was caught up and transferred into heaven so that he did not have a glimpse of death. He was not found because God had translated him. For even before he was taken into heaven, he received testimony that he had pleased him and satisfactory to God. You see, the scripture says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So obviously, Enoch was a man that pleased God because of his faith, so much so that it was his faith that enabled him to be translated or ascended into heaven. He didn't die first and go to heaven. He was alive when he got caught up into heaven. And it was his faith that enabled that to happen. So you're going to learn how to activate your faith and believe that God can take you up. Okay, next, before we go into the activation, I want to tell you some simple things first so that you can understand what might happen so that you won't miss it. When you first start to ascend, things might come to you very subtly. I've had things when I first started ascending come to me so subtly and they manifested into something huge. So I don't want you to miss it. And I'll just give you some simple examples. When I go up, I either stay awake and ascend or I get drawn into a deep trance. I actually fall asleep and then I ascend. And when I stay awake, I'll sit and I'll put my focus on something so I can wait for God. I'll, I'll just look at the back of my eyelids and I'll just see black. And I'll activate my faith and believe that by the power of my, the Spirit in me, I can go up. And I wait for God. And I've seen simple, simple stuff, really subtle stuff that turned into something powerful. And just one example is this. Like I, in the beginning, I would see these like smoky-looking smoke rings, I guess they would look like. And they'd be coming towards me. And as they would come towards me, they'd get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it would almost look like I was passing through them. And they kept on coming like that. And I would go, what is that, God? And he goes, you're going up the tunnel. Oh, see, I thought those rings were coming at me, getting bigger. No, I was moving through the tunnel. That's why they appeared to get bigger as they were getting closer to me, you see. And then, not, co not so coincidentally, when I go back down, they would go in reverse. They would get big in front of me, and they'd go, whoop, whoop. What was I doing? I was going back out the tunnel. Now, that's a very subtle thing. I'm seeing the black of my eyelids and these little white smoke rings. That's it. And you think, well, that's an encounter with God. Yes, it was a big encounter with God. And it, what it did to me is it proved to me I was actually ascending and descending. It was actually working. It caused my faith to increase, which caused my experiences and my visitations to get bigger, more colorful, more loud and triumph and all this other stuff. Okay, and another thing that would happen, I would go up in the beginning and I'd be seeing the black of my eyelids, yeah, could he do? And I would see like this just subtle white light just go, boom, and just wash over me. And you think, well, that doesn't sound like a very big visitation to me. I'll tell you what that is. That's an indication you're in the throne room. You know why? Who are we seated next to? Christ, right? Who's Christ seated next to? God, right? Who is God? What is God? The scripture in Hebrews 1.3 says that God is a light being, an outring source of the divine radiance. So obviously I was up in the throne room and God's light that he was outraying was flowing over me, filling me. Amen. What does light do? We have a teaching that talks about light heals. Jesus used light to heal. Scientists have proven if you want to travel through time, you have to go at the speed of light. Okay, when Christians do translations and transportations, you know what is the mechanics that enable them to do that? Light. Light saturating our spirit and our body is what enables us to get translated or transported like Philip when he came up out of the water after baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch. Or, or Ezekiel when he was translated into the valley of dry bones. It is the vehicle of light. So if you're having just this black of your eyelids and the, the white light flowing over you, you're having a major encounter. You're in the throne room being filled with light. And you're getting prepared for something. You're getting prepared to do a translation or a transportation. Okay? My point in saying all these things is this. It said that you don't just go, mm, that was nothing, and write it off. So now, let's say I go into a trance instead of saying awake. Is that biblical? What does that mean? A trance, the word trance means a half-conscious state seemingly between sleeping and waking in which the ability to function voluntarily might be suspended. In the Bible, Abraham went into a trance. So did Jeremiah. So did Peter. Okay? You know you're gonna, you're, you'll know if you're going into a trance because you'll feel a real strong pull to go to sleep. If you feel that pull, don't fight it. Go to sleep. Don't listen to me anymore. Go to heaven. For real. Jason Westfield came right in the middle of his concert. He's like, okay, now there's going to be a, a grace for trances. And I'm like, you think? <sighs> and the last thing I heard him say is, don't be offended. I won't be offended if you fall asleep on me. And I'm like, good. Yay. 
In fact, I would, if I were you, I'd position yourself to go into a trance. I would lay down on the floor and let God pull you into that state. Because when I'm in trances, I see color. I yeah. see clarity. I see uh, visions. full. On. It's no more of that subtle stuff. It's full-blown. Full-blown visitation. Okay? Let me tell you what Peter experienced in his trance so you know you can experience those same things. It says that Peter went up on the roof. He was praying. This is an axe. And he became very hungry. He wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, a trance came over him. And he saw the sky open and something like a great sheet being lowered and, and descending to earth. In it was all kinds of creeping beasts. And a voice came to him and said, Rise up, Peter, kill and eat. He said, By no means, Lord, I have not eaten anything unclean. And the voice came again and said, Do not decree anything unclean that I have made clean. And this occurred three times, and immediately the sheet was taking up. Okay, so there's Peter. He went into a, a trance. I believe he was ascending when he went into that trance. Why? Because it says that the heavens opened and the sheet descended. Sounds like ascending and descending to me. Right? So he's in this trance, and while he's in there, he can see what? Visions. He could ask the Lord questions. The Lord would answer his questions. See all the different things that he was able to experience in the trance? When I go into trance, I got the same thing going on. I get visions. My visions look like this, just to let you know so you won't miss it. I'll get a flash of a picture. Bam! Just like that fast. And then black. And then maybe another one. And then black. And then maybe another one. And then black. And they're not like a continuous movie reel. Like the big dun 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 dun, dun, dun. It's more like, right, because we think that. We think if we don't get the dun dun dun, that we're not having a visitation. That's wrong. That's a lie. That's the devil trying to tell you you're not having a visitation. Okay, so I get a flash of a vision, and it might be just a still picture, or it might be a short video. Something happening really fast, and then it's over. And then black, and then maybe another one. That's how my visions come to me. Now, you can get the dun dun duns too. I'm looking for those, too. But right now, I'm letting you know, if you don't get them like that, it's okay. You're still having a major, major encounter. Okay, I also can hear the Lord speaking to me, just like Peter. I'll hear the Lord say words. If I see something I don't understand, I'll ask the Lord questions, just like Peter. The P Peter said, oh, I don't know, Lord, I won't do that. He, he talked to the Lord. He spoke to the Lord. I'll do the same thing, and the Lord will respond. The Lord responded to Peter in his trance. The Lord will respond to me. I'll ask him a question, and he'll say something. I might hear a single word, or I might hear uh, like a whole sentence, or I might have an actual knowing of a complete concept inside my spirit. See that? Well, what I'm trying to tell you is your, your experiences don't have to be the exact same as mine, but they, mine are biblical, so I would expect that you can have the anticipation and the expectation of having the same sort of visitation Amen. because it's biblical. Okay? All right, and this is, brings me to my next point really quickly. Before you descend, you need to ask the Lord for two things. One, what do you bring down with you? Whatever you see in those visitations or whatever you hear is yours. You can bring it down. What do the angels do? They ascend it up in heaven. What? To have a party? No. They ascend it up in heaven to take hold of heavenly enablements and then bring them and descend back down to earth with them. That's what you're going to do. You go up and you get stuff. Can you legally take stuff that you see in heaven that you hear God speaking about or hear or see God showing you? Yes, the scripture in Deuteronomy 29 says the secret things belong to God, but the things revealed to us belong to us and our children forever, forever. So when you go up into heaven, you ask God, what do you want me to bring down with you, with me? And he will speak it to you. Grab hold of it by faith and bring it down. Next, as before you descend, ask the Lord for glory. Remember, Jesus already gave us the glory that the Father gave him. It already belongs to us. We need the glory here on earth so we can create, so we can have power, so that we can be transformed. So as you're going down, say, Lord, I want to take with me the glory that Jesus already gave me, and by faith, grab a hold of it. Bring it down. And when you come back here, I want you to open up your eyes and release it. I want you to open your mouth and say, I loose this glory into the atmosphere now in Jesus' name. And then I want you to begin to speak your petitions and your prayers that you've been waiting for all these years to come to pass into that glory so that they can start really happening. Amen? So I want to just first impart this impartation to the people by media that will be listening um, all the people by media that will be listening to this, I, I release to you the realms for higher visitation. I command the realms to open for you in Jesus' name right now. 
And I fill you with a thirst for God in Jesus' name right now. Receive the impartation of heavenly visitation now in Jesus' name. 